Hello, everyone. Today, we'll be focusing on discussing the 75 NCLEX questions that are frequently seen on the exam. Hopefully, this will help direct your preparation toward crucial areas, and hopefully, this will boost your confidence and improve your chances in successfully passing the NCLEX in your first attempt. So let's get into the first item. Question here, a client at nine weeks gestation asks when she can have chorionic vela sampling or CVS. What is the optimal time for this test? A, eight to 10 weeks, B, 12 to 14 weeks, C, 10 to 12 weeks, and D, 14 to 16 weeks. The correct answer here is letter C. This is the ideal time for the CVS. And this will also allow time to make decisions based on the results without compromising the safety. If you selected letter A, this is incorrect because CVS typically is not done before 10 weeks due to the risks such as digit reduction. And letter B, this time frame is too late for the CVS. And what you should expect here around this time will be the genetic amniocentesis. And letter D is also incorrect because this is outside of the window for the CVS and indicates a time when amniocentesis is more appropriate. So your task in this test question is to recall the appropriate timing and also the accuracy or the appropriate diagnostic test um, to be done according to the gestational age. Let's have number two. How should a nurse prepare an IV piggyback medication for a client receiving IV fluids? Select all that apply. A, use 100 ml of diluent for medication mixing. B, confirm the IV side using clean gloves. And C, gently mix the bag after adding the medication. And D, replace the needle before adding the bag or drug. E, position the IV piggyback lower than the primary IV. And letter F, ensure sterility when preparing the medication. The correct answers here are letters B, C, and F. You need to wear a pair of clean gloves to prevent contamination while you are checking for any complications at the IV site, such as the infiltration or phlebitis. And letter C, you need to gently mix the bag once the medication is uh, mixed or if it's already instilled to allow even distribution of the solution and also letter F. This is also correct. You have to make sure that this is observed to avoid introduction of pathogens into the bloodstream. Now, letter A is incorrect because the required diluent volume depends on the specific medication and also the provider's prescription. And letter D, there's no necessity to change the needle if the sterility is preserved throughout the preparation. And letter E, you have to place the piggyback bag higher than the primary bag to allow gravity flow, not the other way around. So what you need to do in this test question is to look for the best practices related to prevention of the infection, and also the correct preparation methods and also the placement of the bag once you're ready to hang the medication. Let's have number three. A client with chronic undifferentiated schizophrenia is on antipsychotic medication. Which of the following should the nurse monitor for as a potentially irreversible adverse effect? A, torticollis, B, oculogyre crisis, C, tardive dyskinesia, letter D, pseudoparkinsonism. The answer here is letter C. Tardive dyskinesia is a serious, potentially irreversible adverse effect, especially from long-term antipsychotic medication use. And your patient with this type of issue will have the involuntary movements such as lip smacking, could be tongue protrusion, and often occurs after a prolonged treatment. Now, if you selected letter A, this is incorrect because this is what we call as neck spasms. And this is reversible with medication adjustments or let's say discontinuation of the antipsychotic. Letter B is also incorrect. This is the rolling of the eyes to the back. 
this is also a reversible side effect. And this is typically treated with anticholinergic medication. And letter D is also incorrect. This is similar to Parkinson's disease symptoms. This is also reversible whenever the medication dose is changed or possibly after treating this with anticholinergic medication. Let's have number four. A client with inflammatory bowel disease is receiving total parenteral nutrition or TPN via an infusion pump. What is most important for the nurse to do when administering TPN? A, monitor the client's blood glucose level every two hours at the bedside with a glucometer. B, change the TPN solution bag every 24 hours, even if there is solution left in the bag. C, instruct the client to breathe shallowly when changing the TPN tubing using sterile technique and letter D, speed up the rate of the TPN infusion if the amount delivered has fallen behind the prescribed hourly rate. You should answer letter B. Because the TPN solutions are high in glucose content and it will provide a good medium for bacterial growth. So there is that requirement to change the solution bag daily in order to prevent contamination of microbes. And this will also reduce the risk of infection. Now, letter A is incorrect because the blood glucose should be monitored every four hours to every six hours to prevent hypoglycemia or maybe hyperglycemia. Every two hours is a little bit more than the required frequency. Uh, letter C is also incorrect because changing the TPN tubing should not require shallow breathing. Instead, the patient should be instructed uh, to do the Valsalvas maneuver uh, to prevent air embolism. Now, letter D is also incorrect because if you're increasing the TPN infusion rate, this is not advisable because it might cause hyperglycemia and the rate should be adjusted according to the client's response to prevent complications. Let's have number five. A client diagnosed with HIV asks whether they should disclose their status to their partner. What is the most supportive response by the nurse? A, you must decide what is best for your situation. B, it seems you're uncertain about how to approach this conversation. C, it's better not to share unless directly asked. D, explain to your partner that you are unsure how this happened. The answer here should be letter B. This is an open-ended response which will encourage the client to discuss their feelings and also explore the possible actions. And this is something that can also support a much more therapeutic communication. Whereas if you select the letter A, this is incorrect because even though it kind of acknowledges autonomy, but it lacks emotional support and also engagement. And same thing with letter C, this is incorrect because when you're advising against disclosure, unless ask is harmful and it is an inappropriate. Now, if you selected letter D, making an unfounded suggestion can also mislead the client and this can damage trust. So in this question, you need to prioritize the therapeutic communication by selecting those responses or that response that can validate the client's feelings and that can encourage dialogue. And you have to eliminate those options that will shut down the conversation or provide inappropriate advice. Let's have number six. A client in active labor has had slow cervical dilation from two to three centimeters over the past eight hours. The provider orders oxytocin to augment contractions. What is the most important nursing action now? A, monitor contraction duration and intensity. B, check the perineum for bulging. C, document fetal heart rate and its variations. And D, prepare for an emergency cesarean birth. The answer is letter A. 
monitoring the duration and intensity of the contraction is very important when you are administering oxytocin to prevent overstimulation, which can compromise fetal well-being. Now, if you select the letter B, this is incorrect because a bulging perineum is typically seen when the cervix is fully dilated and the baby is about to be delivered. And so the cervix is still only two to three centimeters dilated. Letter C is also incorrect because uh, monitoring the fetal heart rate is important throughout the labor, but it's not the first priority in this case. Now, letter D, prepare for an emergency cesarean birth. There's no indication yet at this point that a C-section is necessary. So the priority at this point is to ensure safe labor progression with oxytocin. Let's have number seven. A 45-year-old male with chronic kidney disease is admitted with signs of swelling in his lower extremities. Upon assessment, he is found to have generalized edema, particularly in the legs and feet. What is the primary cause of his edema? A, decrease in tissue hydrostatic pressure. B, increase in plasma hydrostatic pressure. C, increase in tissue colloid osmotic pressure. And letter D, reduction in plasma colloid oncotic pressure? The answer is letter D, because albumin loss can reduce the plasma oncotic pressure, which will also impair the reabsorption of fluid into the capillaries, which will end up into edema. If you selected letter A, this is incorrect because Tissue hydrostatic pressure is unrelated to protein loss in the blood. Same thing with letter B. The hydrostatic pressure here depends on the volume of the fluid and also the blood vessel diameter. And it's not directly on albumin levels. And same thing with letter C. This is incorrect. Uh, the tissue colloid osmotic pressure does not increase in this context. Let's have number eight. A nurse is monitoring a client with severe preeclampsia who is receiving magnesium sulfate infusion. The client has a pulse rate of 54 beats per minute, respirations of 12 cycles per minute, and a flushed face. What is the next step in this care? A. Maintain the infusion and notify the healthcare provider. B. Continue the infusion and document the findings. C. Stop the infusion and start an infusion of D5 water. And D, decrease the infusion rate and obtain a magnesium level. Your answer should be letter C. Because the signs that you are having in the case are signs of magnesium sulfate toxicity. So what you should do here is to stop the infusion immediately and start an infusion of D5 water. So let's have a quick review regarding the toxic effects of the magnesium sulfate in this case. So recall that magnesium can depress the respiratory center in the brain, which can also lead to respiratory depression. So what you're seeing here, especially with the 12 cycles per minute uh, respiratory rate, indicates early sign of respiratory compromise. And take note that magnesium can also cause vasodilation, which can also lead to a lower height, heart rate, which is 54 beats per minute in this case. It can also lead to low blood pressure and also cardiac arrest in higher uh, levels of the magnesium. And we know that the magnesium, if there is way too much magnesium, it can also disrupt the cardiac electrical conduction. It can also lead to prolonged PR intervals. It can widen the QRS complexes when you are checking it on the ECG. And you should check these patient uh, continuously on the cardiac monitor for any lethal arrhythmias. Now, if you select a letter A, maintain the infusion and notify the healthcare provider. Well, if you're just gonna continue, this will exacerbate the client's symptoms. Uh, we know that the toxicity of this medication can lead to much more severe uh, respiratory and cardiac depression. Now, letter B, continue the infusion and document the findings. These actions are not safe because you're actually delaying, you're actually harming the patient this time. This is uh, actually a medical emergency. 
Now, letter D is also incorrect because the infusion rate should be stopped, not decreased. We know that our patient already has the early signs of magnesium toxicity. Let's have number nine. A 32-year-old client with a history of chronic barbiturate use presents to the emergency department after abruptly discontinuing the medication two days ago. Which of the following symptoms is the nurse most concerned about? A, ataxia, B, seizure, C, diarrhea, D, hives. Your answer should be letter B because an abrupt withdrawal from the barbiturates is, uh, it can lead to serious complications such as seizures. This is a form of your withdrawal. And this is life threatening. So you gotta make sure that you are carefully monitoring um, this patient, especially if they have not taken the drug for quite some time. Now, letter A, ataxia is not a symptom typically associated with barbiturate withdrawal. It will occur in other conditions, but it's not common in withdrawal. Now, for letter C, this is incorrect. Diarrhea is not a typical symptom of barbiturate withdrawal. And letter D, hives or orticaria is also unrelated to barbiturate withdrawal and it's usually a response to allergic reactions but not from sedative hypnotic medications let's have number 10. a client with arthritis increases their ibuprofen dose without medical advice and develops severe anemia during admission what symptoms is the nurse most likely to observe, select all that apply. A, black terry stools. B, rapid heart rate. C, constipation. D, pale colored stools. And E, painful defecation. The answers here are letters A and B. The black terry stools indicates gastrointestinal bleeding, which is a known complication of long-term non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug use. A letter B, which is tachycardia. This can happen as the body will try to compensate for the decreasing oxygen delivery due to the anemia. While with you answered letter C, this is incorrect because constipation is not related to GI bleeding. Constipation is linked to low fiber or dehydration. Now, if you select letter D, pale colored stools, this typically indicate biliary obstruction, but not anemia. And letter E, painful defecation. It's usually related to hemorrhoids or anal fissures, but not systemic anemia. So your task in this question is to recall the pathophysiology behind the anemia caused by the GI bleeding and look for those signs that will correlate with blood loss and also decrease oxygen carrying capacity. Let's have number 11. A nurse inadvertently administers an intravenous potassium solution too rapidly. In response, the healthcare provider prescribes the addition of insulin to a 10% dextrose in water solution. What is the purpose of this intervention? A, to shift potassium into the cells with glucose and insulin. B, to increase the excretion of potassium and glucose. C, to accelerate metabolic activity and potassium removal. And D, to slow down insulin production affected by excess potassium. Your answer here should be letter A. Well, how does the insulin with the dextrose help in treating the hyperkalemia? So I want you to recall this time that uh, this intervention will consist of uh, administering a regular insulin, and this will act as a key, which will help the potassium to move from the bloodstream into the cells. Again, our patient has a case of hyperkalemia. And so the insulin will basically help in the uptake of the excess potassium, and this will be shifted into the intracellular compartment. Now, why is dextrose included here? Well, this will prevent hypoglycemia because we are actually administering the insulin, which will lead to the hypoglycemia. And uh, the 
mixture or the administration of these two medication can quickly lower the potassium level in the blood and this will protect the heart from the dangerous arrhythmias. Now, letter B is incorrect because insulin does not increase potassium or glucose excretion. The insulin will only facilitate cellular uptake. And letter C is also incorrect because metabolic activity does not directly remove potassium from the serum. And letter D, potassium levels do not influence pancreatic insulin production as well. So your task here is to recall the physiologic effects of the insulin and potassium and eliminate those options suggesting excretion or unrelated processes. Let's have number 12. A nurse is caring for a client with acute kidney failure who is on a protein-restricted diet. What should the nurse explain to the client about the necessity of this diet? A. A high-protein diet ensures sufficient amino acids for tissue repair. B. Essential and non-essential amino acids from food are needed for protein synthesis. And C. This diet provides only essential amino acids to reduce metabolic waste and ease kidney stress. And D, nitrogen for amino acid synthesis must come from dietary protein because urea cannot be used. The answer is letter C. Because a protein-restricted diet limits the production of urea nitrogen, which could otherwise accumulate and also stress the kidney. So here, the focus is on providing the amino acids. We're talking about essential amino acids to minimize metabolic waste. Now, if you selected letter A, this is incorrect because a high protein diet would actually worsen kidney function in acute kidney failure because of the increase in the waste products like urea. And letter B is also incorrect because the body can synthesize non-essential amino acids. So they do not need to come from the diet in the same way essential amino acids do. And letter D is also incorrect because urea is a waste product from protein metabolism and it cannot be used for amino acid synthesis. Let's have number 13. An elderly patient is brought to the emergency department on a hot summer day. The patient is unresponsive and presents with dry skin, rapid breathing, and tachycardia. What is the nurse's priority intervention? A. Start cooling the client by removing clothing. B. Intubate the client to secure the airway. C. Administer cool oral fluids. And D. Perform airway suctioning. The answer is letter A, removing the clothing can help dissipate the body heat quickly, which is important in treating the hyperthermia. And this should be your first step before considering other cooling measures. Now, letter B, uh, the intubation may be needed, but it's not the first line intervention for hyperthermia. And when you are doing letter C, administering cool oral fluids is contraindicated because the client is unresponsive and this will increase their risk of aspiration. And letter D, this is also incorrect because there are no signs indicating the need for suctioning in this case. So what you need to select here is to focus on that option that is non-invasive cooling method when you are addressing the hyperthermia and you have to eliminate those options that are either too invasive or inappropriate for an unresponsive client. Let's have number 14. A nurse reviews orders for a 28 year old client dehydrated from prolonged diarrhea. Which order should be questioned? A, oral, cilium, B, intravenous albumin, C, potassium chloride orally in the intravenous half saline solution? The answer is letter B. That's intravenous albumin. Because this is a hypertonic solution, 
And this can also exacerbate dehydration by pulling more fluid from the cells into the vascular space. For letter A, this is a wrong selection because psyllium can add bulk to the stool, which may reduce diarrhea frequency. And the same thing with letter C, potassium chloride orally. This is going to be very important in counteracting the losses of potassium from the diarrhea. And letter D, IV half normal saline solution is a hypotonic IV, which can help rehydrate the cells effectively. And so for you to answer or select the uh, option, you have to identify that treatment that will exacerbate dehydration. We are looking for that option. That is going to be an erroneous intervention. Okay, so we are not supposed to administer hypertonic solution this time because these are not appropriate in patients with dehydration because of fluid shifting. Let's have number 15. A pregnant client with severe abdominal pain and heavy bleeding is preparing for an emergency cesarean birth. What should the nurse prioritize? A, obtain informed consent and check for drug allergies. B, teach coughing and deep breathing exercises. C, sterilize the surgical site and administer an enema. And D, provide a sterile gown and insert an indwelling catheter. The answer is letter A. Obtaining an informed consent and also reviewing the client's drug allergies is of higher priority or highest priority, especially in an emergency situation. And this will prevent uh, any errors. Now, letter B is incorrect. We know that deep breathing and coughing exercises are important. But around this time, during an emergency situation, this is not going to uh, take place um, on option letter A. This will, should not take over for that option. Now, for letter C and D, these are also incorrect. We know that some of these tasks are necessary for surgery. And some of these are usually done in the OR. But uh, administering an enema, especially with active bleeding, can actually worsen the, con the condition. And so this should not be your choice. So again, in an emergency situation, your highest priority would be to always ensure that an informed consent and patient safety, such as checking for any allergies, are done first. And you have to eliminate those options that focus on preparation tasks done after having the consent um, taken. Let's have number 16. A client with a seizure history is scheduled for an arteriogram at 10 a.m. and must remain NPO before the procedure. The client's anticonvulsant medication is due at 9 a.m. What is the nurse's best course of action? A, skip the 9 a.m. dose of the medication. B, give the medication rectally. C, administer the medication with 30 mLs of water. And letter D, check with the healthcare provider about an IV route for the drug. The answer here is letter D. We need to maintain the therapeutic levels of the anticonvulsant. If the oral intake is not possible, you need to consult with a healthcare provider and ask possibly if there is an alternative route such as IV in order to ensure continued efficacy and also therapeutic level of the drug. Now, letter A is incorrect because skipping the dose can reduce the blood level below the therapeutic levels, which will increase their risk of a seizure. The same thing with letter B. This is also incorrect because administering the medication via a different route can only be done when it's approved by the healthcare provider. And letter C is also incorrect because this patient needs to be NPO. So if you're administering the medication with 
some water, this is going to uh, be inappropriate. It will actually disqualify the patient for the intended procedure because of that water intake. So here in this test question, you need to consider the client's safety and the therapeutic needs while they are using the anticonvulsant drug. And also the route of the medication should be um, taken care of. You're not supposed to be giving any oral medications this time when the patient is supposed to be an PO. Let's have number 17. A client presents in ED with pallor and is moaning and has been diagnosed with esophageal varices upon hospital admission. The healthcare provider has ordered a blood transfusion. What actions should the nurse take? A, take the vital signs, verify the blood product with another nurse against the client's ID bracelet and monitor the vital signs according to agency policy. B, since the vital signs were recorded during admission, hang the blood and monitor the client's vital signs every 15 minutes until the transfusion is absorbed. C, record the vital signs per facility policy and check the blood product against the client's ID bracelet in the presence of the nursing supervisor. And D, take the vital signs after hanging the blood because the client is pale and moaning and is in critical condition. Return in 15 minutes to monitor the vital signs. You should be selecting letter A this time. You got to take initial or baseline vital signs and confirm the blood product with another nurse to ensure safety. And this will also allow accurate monitoring of any transfusion reactions or any complication. And so if you selected letter B, this is incorrect because we know that the vital sign should be checked immediately before and after the blood product is administered, not just during the transfusion. C is also incorrect because checking the blood product against the client's ID bracelet in the presence of a nursing supervisor is not necessary. It should be done with another licensed nurse. Letter D, the nurse actually should not wait 15 minutes to take the vital signs after hanging the blood because it's important for us to monitor the client closely from the start to detect any immediate adverse reactions. Let's have number 18. A three-month-old infant with respiratory sensitive virus or RSV is hospitalized. What should be the nurse's primary intervention? A, administer an antiviral medication. B, cluster care to minimize energy expenditure. And C, offer oral fluids to maintain hydration. And D, provide antitussive medication as needed. The answer is letter B, cluster care to minimize energy expenditure. Because at three months, the infant with the RSV often have very limited pulmonary reserves. So when you are clustering the care, this is very important to provide periods of rest and also can conserve the energy, which will help prevent further respiratory distress. Now, letter A is incorrect because the antiviral therapy for RSV is controversial and generally not administered unless complications occur. And for letter C, during the acute phase, IV fluids are preferred over oral fluids to prevent the dehydration. And the oral fluids are not typically given due to the, uh, pa the patient's or the infant's compromised ability to maintain hydration. And letter D is also incorrect because the anti of meds are not recommended for infants with RSV. And uh, the nasal secretions should be managed using a bulb syringe instead. Let's have number 19. A client who has undergone open reduction and in internal fixation or ORIF of a fractured ankle is preparing for discharge. Which behavior shows the need for further education about crutch use? A moving both crutches with a weaker leg b using the armpits to bear the body's weight on the crutches 
C, holding both the crutches in one hand when sitting down, and D, leading with the unaffected leg when going downstairs? The answer is letter B. Because the weight should be supported by the hands on the crutches crossbars, not the armpits. And if you're going to allow this to happen, this can result into crutch palsy, which is caused by the pressure on the brachial plexus, which can lead to the muscle weakness or paralysis. Now, if you select the letter A, this is also incorrect because advancing both crutches with a weaker leg is the proper technique that will help maintain the balance. And letter C, holding both crutches in one hand when sitting down is a standard practice, and it will allow the other hand to be free for assistance. And letter D is also a uh, wrong option here because when you're allowing the patient to move the crutches before the unaffected leg when descending the stairs is the correct order to ensure safety while they are navigating the stairs so in this test question you're actually looking for that action that will put the patient at risk for the injury or any kind of complication so you need to avoid those behaviors that involve inappropriate weight-bearing or improper positioning. Number 19. A nurse is, number 20 rather, a nurse provides teaching to a multi woman who just gave birth to a large baby and about how to help maintain a contracted uterus. Which statement by the mother indicates understanding? A, I will call for help if I start to bleed. B, frequent urination will help my uterus stay contracted. And C, I will massage my uterus regularly to keep it firm. And D, I will ask you to massage my uterus every 15 minutes. The answer is letter C, because massaging the uterus can help stimulate the contraction it will also maintain firmness, which is important in the postpartum phase to prevent hemorrhage. Now, letter A, waiting for the signs of bleeding is too late. So in this case, the uterus should be massaged proactively to maintain the uh, uterine tone. Um, letter B, uh, although uh, vo uh, the voiding here, frequent urination, we know that uh, frequent urination is beneficial for overall comfort, but it doesn't directly influence uterine contraction. Now, letter D is also incorrect because the mother should actively participate in her care by massaging her own uterus and asking the nurse to do it is not ideal. Let's have number 21. A nurse monitors a client undergoing gastric lavage. What imbalance is the nurse most concerned about? A, increased bicarbonate levels. B, reduced blood pH. C, elevated oxygen saturation. And D, decreased osmotic pressure. The answer is letter A. So that is increased bicarbonate levels. Well, how is this going to happen? Well, when actually the patient is losing hydrochloric acid from the gastric fluid, especially with the lavage, this can lead to the accumulation of bicarbonate in the blood, which can lead to metabolic alkalosis. And we know that the hydrochloric acid consists of hydrogen ions and also the chloride ions. And so when the hydrochloride is removed in greater amounts, there will be fewer hydrogen ions available in the bloodstream to maintain normal acidity. And what the body can do here is to try to compensate for the loss of acid by retaining the bicarbonate, leading to an increase in the bicarbonate levels in the blood, which is the metabolic alkalosis. And this can result into muscle twitching. Uh, also, irritability can lead to confusion in some cardiac arrhythmias if the, uh, the patient's case is so severe. Now, letter A or letter B, reduced blood pH is incorrect because lavage can cause alkalosis, not acidosis, which can 
lead to an increasing pH. Letter C is also incorrect because oxygen saturation remains unaffected by gastric lavage. And letter D is also incorrect because the dehydration from the lavage can raise the osmotic pressure rather than lowering it. Let's have number 22. A client is enrolled in a six-week course of electroconvulsive therapy, ECT. What is a key intervention to implement throughout this treatment period? A, providing tyramine-free meals. B, preventing exposure to sunlight. C, ensuring a steady sodium intake. And D, discontinuing benzodiazepines for nighttime sedation. The answer is letter D, because benzodiazepines can increase the seizure threshold which is not beneficial for patients undergoing ect and uh, we know that ect relies on inducing controlled seizures and the use of the sedatives like the benzos can interfere this process and so Discontinuation of the benzodiazepines is important during this six-week treatment to ensure the effectiveness of ECT. Now, if you selected letter A, this is incorrect because a tyramine-free diet is important for those patients on monoamine oxidase inhibitors, not for those undergoing ECT because ECT does not require dietary restrictions like those for MAOIs. Now, if you select the letter B, this is also incorrect because the sun exposure is not a concern with ECT. There is no significant relationship between ECT and photosensitivity. And letter C is also incorrect because a steady sodium intake is a requirement for patients on lithium therapy, not for those undergoing uh, ECT. So it does not really specifically require sodium intake monitoring. Let's have number 23. A client newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is taught insulin administration, glucose monitoring, dietary planning, and insulin adjustment. The client successfully demonstrates these skills before being discharged. What legal aspects does this scenario emphasize? A. The nurse fulfills the role of an educator in client care. B, family members must be included in diabetes education. And C, discharge education should have been conducted at home. And D, only a healthcare provider is authorized to provide this education. Your answer should be letter A, because teaching health promotion and also self-care skills is the core responsibility of the primary nurse. This is outlined in the Nurse Practice Act. And this also supports the client's independence and also self-management after they get discharged. Now, if you select letter B, this is incorrect because we know that uh, family members can be helpful, but the primary focus is on equipping the client with self-care skills. Same thing with letter C, this is incorrect because immediate discharge education will ensure the client is prepared for independent management before they leave the hospital. And letter D is also incorrect because nurses independently can provide education on care practices without requiring additional provider input. So what you need to do in this test question is to focus on the primary nurse's legal and ethical responsibilities. So if you meet the words teaching, supporting, client independence, can align with nursing practice standards. Number 24. A nurse assesses a postpartum client who underwent a cesarean section and is preparing for discharge on the third day after delivery. Where is the nurse likely to find the position of the fundus? A, one finger breadth below the umbilicus, C or B, three finger breadths below the umbilicus, C, two finger breadths below the umbilicus, and D, four finger breadths below the umbilicus. Your answer here should be letter B. 
because the fundus typically can descend by one finger breadth each day after the delivery, by after childbirth. So at the end of the third day, or let's say by the third day rather, it should be three finger breadths below the umbilicus. Now, if you selected either A, C, or D, now if the fundus is positioned on these levels, it basically suggests that the involution may not be progressing as expected. And so this indicates that there is a need for further assessment and possibly intervention. Let's have number 25. A nurse is caring for a client with a tentative diagnosis of pheochromocytoma who is receiving chlorpromazine, a 24-hour urine specimen to assess the presence of vanillyl mandelic acid or the VMA is ordered to assist in confirming the diagnosis. What information should the nurse include in the client teaching regarding this test? A. The client may take chlorpromazine during the test. B, encourage the client to engage in usual activities during the test. C, only salicylates can be taken for discomforts during the test. And D, all urine excreted over the 24-hour period must be saved and refrigerated. And E, avoid coffee, chocolate, and citrus fruit for three days before and during the test. The answers are letters D and E. We have to collect all urine excreted during the 24-hour period. And this has to be refrigerated or should be placed in a designated receptacle that has a um, cooling bucket. Or let's say something we're going to have to put the urine specimen in a jog and should be placed on or... Um, in a bucket that is full of ice, okay? And this is to prevent um, any degradation of the urine consistency and also its uh, chemical properties. Now, letter E is also correct because these food items can increase the VMA levels and these should be avoided to prevent false positive results. Now, if you select the letter A, this is incorrect because... Chlorpromazine can elevate the VMA levels. So the use of this medication should be discussed with the healthcare provider before the test to avoid misleading or false positive results. Now, letter B is also incorrect because physical activity uh, can also increase the VMA levels, which might also give a false positive test result. And with letter C, only salicylates aspirin can be taken for discomfort during the test. The salicylates or aspirin can also increase the VMA levels, and this should be avoided to prevent interference with the test results. Number 26. A patient with diabetic ketoacidosis is receiving IV fluids for treatment. Why is potassium chloride added to the IV fluids? A to prevent the onset of cardiac arrhythmias, B, to address excessive fluid and electrolyte losses, C, to avoid the development of muscular weakness, and D, to improve respiratory symptoms like hyperpnea. Your answer should be letter B, because in DKA, the insulin therapy can shift the potassium from the bloodstream into the cells, which can cause the hypokalemia. And so when you're adding the potassium chloride, this can help restore the potassium levels to prevent the complications related to the potassium deficiency that is temporary. Now, if you select a letter A, um, although the potassium affects cardiac function, but its administration and DKA primarily prevents hypokalemia caused by the insulin. Now, if you selected a letter C, uh, muscular weakness or flaccid paralysis is not typically associated with DKA. And so the priority here is the electrolyte balance. Now, letter D is also incorrect because potassium supplementation does not directly address respiratory symptoms 
like hyperpnea, which is related to acidosis. Let's have number 27. A two-week-old infant diagnosed with a congenital heart defect is admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit due to poor feeding and failure to thrive. The healthcare team decides to initiate gavage feedings as part of the nutritional care plan. The parents asks or ask why this method is recommended. How should the nurse respond? A, it helps prevent vomiting. B, it ensures the feeding is completely or com is completed quickly. C, it conserves energy by avoiding the effort of sucking. And D, it allows for better control of feeding amounts. The answer is letter C, because gavage feeding is used for infants with congenital heart defects who are weak and who have respiratory distress and who are unable to coordinate sucking and swallowing effectively. And so this can conserve the energy and this will allow the infant to receive nutrition without unnecessary exertion. Now, letter A is also incorrect because we know that vomiting may be less frequent due to controlled feedings. Um, preventing the vomiting is not the primary purpose of gavage feeding. Now, B is also incorrect because rapid feedings are not ideal because they can lead to aspiration or distress in infants with heart defects. Now, letter D is also incorrect. We know that gavage feeding can help control the amount of food, but this is secondary to the primary goal of energy conservation. Let's have number 28. A nurse is educating a client with a colostomy of the ascending colon about using a colostomy appliance. Which instruction should, be, should the nurse provide to help prevent leakage of stool from the appliance? A, irrigate the colostomy to establish an expected pattern of elimination. B, empty the appliance when it is approximately one half full of feces. And C, use an antiseptic to clean the peristomal skin before applying the appliance. And D, select an appliance with a pouch opening at least 5 centimeters larger than the stoma. The answer is letter B. Because you need to empty the colostomy appliance when it is half full to reduce undue weight of the feces on the appliance and this will also prevent it from pooling away from the skin and causing leaks. Now if you selected letter A, this is incorrect because irrigating the colostomy is not usually done in the ascending colon stoma because it results in semi-liquid stools which do not really require irrigation. Now if you selected letter C, the antiseptic can be harsh on the peristomal skin and it can cause irritation. And so what you should do here instead is to clean it with mild soap and water. And for letter D, this is also incorrect because the stoma opening should be close fitting to avoid leaks, not excessively large, which would expose the peristomal to skin irritation. Number 29. A client with hypokalemia is being prepared for IV potassium replacement and is placed on a cardiac monitor. What cardiac change is the nurse most likely to observe on the monitor before starting the potassium infusion? A. Shortening of the QT interval. B. Depressed ST segment. C. Widening of the QRS complex. And D. Flattened T wave. The answer is letter D because hypokalemia actually will reduce the potassium's effect on the heart muscle during repolarization, which will flatten or it can lower the T waves while you are observing the ECG. Now, letter A is incorrect because hypokalemia can lengthen the QT interval. It does not shorten the QT interval. Now, letter B is also incorrect. Uh, because we know that uh, ST depression can occur, right? But this is less specific than the T-wave flattening for the hypokalemia. And letter C is also incorrect because 
a widened QRS complex is associated with hyperkalemia, not hypokalemia. Number 30. A client is scheduled for a bilateral adrenalectomy. Before surgery, steroids are administered to the client. What does the nurse determine is the reason for the steroids? A, foster accumulation of glycogen in the liver. B, increase the inflammatory action to promote scar formation. C, facilitate urinary excretion of salt and water following surgery. And D, compensate for sudden lack of these hormones following surgery. You should be selecting letter D this time because steroids are given to replace adrenal hormones. And this will also help the body cope with the stress following the surgical procedure because the adrenal glands will no longer produce these hormones. Now, if you select the letter A, this is incorrect because we know that steroids influence glucose metabolism. But the role in this context is not to accumulate glycogen, but to maintain normal blood glucose levels during stress. Now, letter B is also incorrect because steroids have an anti-inflammatory effect, which would be counterproductive to promoting scar formation. And letter C, because uh, this is also incorrect because steroids do not facilitate the excretion of salt and water, but rather it will lead to water retention. And so the patient should not be administered with the intent of encouraging urine excretion. Let's have number 31. A nurse assesses the perineum of a client receiving a radium implant for cervical cancer and notices that the vaginal packing has shifted and is protruding. Why is it essential to notify the healthcare provider immediately to remove the packing? A, to prevent harm to healthy tissues from the radioactive material. B, to stop significant blood loss. C, to avoid reducing the radium's therapeutic potency when exposed to the environment. And D, to lessen the risk of a severe radiation-related injury. You should select letter A this time because the purpose of the packing with the radium is to ensure the radioactive material remains correctly positioned. And so the proper placement can minimize exposure to the surrounding healthy tissues, which will reduce the risk of radiation-induced damage. So if you selected the letter B to stop significant blood loss, we know that active bleeding is not typically associated with the radium implants. Um, what is expected here instead is the cellular shedding or the sloughing but it will not result into excessive blood loss. Now, letter C is also incorrect because the exposure of the radium implant to the environment does not decrease its effectiveness. The therapeutic potency of the radium remains unchanged despite the exposure. Letter D is also incorrect. Um, while we know that prolonged exposure of healthy tissues to radiation can lead to the harm, but this is not usually life-threatening. What we have to do here instead is immediate attention in order to limit the damage. But life-threatening is an overstatement in this case. Now let's have number 32. A three-month-old infant with ventriculoperitoneal shunt revision is diagnosed with meningitis. Which of the following clinical signs support the diagnosis? Select all that apply. A, fever, B, lethargy, C, stiff neck, B, uh, D, poor feeding, and letter E, depressed fontanelles. Your selection should be letters A, C, and D because fever is a common sign of infection. And in this case, it would indicate meningitis. And the fever usually starts as low grade and then progresses to a high fever. Now, letter C is also correct because the nuchal rigidity or stiff neck is a hallmark sign of meningitis. As we know that the inflammation in the meninges can lead to the neck muscle stiffness and pain. Now, letter D is also correct because poor feeding is often a sign of central nervous system irritation, in, especially in infants with meningitis. And it may be due to 
the irritability or let's say discomfort caused by the infection. Now, letter B is incorrect. Uh, lethargy is not typically associated with meningitis in infants. Rather, irritability is more common. Now, letter E, the fontanels would usually be tense or bulging in this case of increased intracranial pressure, not depressed. We know that depression of the fontanels is going to indicate that there is possibly dehydration or malnutrition. Number 33, a 45-year-old client with a history of autoimmune disease is admitted with signs of infection and a compromised immune system. The healthcare provider orders a series of lab tests to assess the client's immune function. Which blood protein plays a key role in immune defense and should be assessed in this client? A, hemoglobin, B, thrombin, C, globulin, and D, albumin. You should be selecting letter C this time because the globulins, particularly the gamma globulins, include antibodies that are critical for immune defense. And this is going to be so important in assessing immune function. Now, letter A is uh, incorrect because hemoglobin is responsible for oxygen transport, not immune function. For letter B, thrombin is part of the clotting cascade and it's not related to immunity. And letter D, albumin. Let's proceed with question number 34. A parent asks why the closure of their child's cleft palate should be done before age two. What should the nurse explain? A, surgery after age two is frightening and should be avoided. B, the two-year molars often complicate the surgery. C, as your child grows, the palate becomes harder to repair. And D, the surgery should be done before your child develops faulty speech patterns. The answer is letter D, because the surgical repair of a cleft palate should be done before the speech development starts to ensure the child has the best chance for normal speech patterns. Letter A is incorrect because this is not the main concern. The issue is with speech development. And the same thing with letter B, this is incorrect because the eruption of two-year molars is not the primary reason for timing the surgery. And letter C is also incorrect. We know that this is true to some extent, but the primary reason for surgery is to address speech before it is expected or affected. Let's have question number 35. Which toys are appropriate for a toddler during the hospitalization? Select all that apply. A, mobile. B, tricycle. C, pounding toy. D, clay. E, 10-piece puzzle. The correct answers are letters C and D. Options, letter C, the pounding toy, and also letter D, clay, are appropriate for toddlers because they engage the child in activities that will allow for emotional expression and also the development of fine motor skills. And these toys will help the toddler work through feelings of hospitalization in a healthy way. Now, you selected letter A. That is also incorrect. Uh, this is more suitable for an infant, not a toddler. For letter B, tricycle is way too advanced for a two-year-old child. And letter E, a tetan piece puzzle is likely too complex for a toddler. Before we're going to continue on the second part, we want you to achieve NCLEX success with Stan Coast NCLEX coaching. And so we're inviting you to enroll to our uh, NCLEX program. So you can get access to 10,000 real questions, daily live classes, and 500 hours of recorded lessons and also 100 hours of animated crash course and 50 practice tests, including NGN style questions. So don't miss the limited offer. This is 70% off. And so we're hoping that you can master your NCLEX prep with a Stancoast expert led online course that will feature comprehensive resources and also engaging lessons. So don't wait, enroll now and take the next step toward your nursing career. So kindly visit www stancoastnclexcoaching.com today. Welcome back to the second part of the Q&A. So let's proceed with question number 36. A 42-year-old male client receiving acetalopram or Lexapro for depression 
refuses to take the medication on day five, stating it doesn't help. So why take it? How should the nurse respond? A, it can take one to four weeks to notice an improvement. B, it will take six to eight weeks for this medication to show any effect. And C, I'll inform your provider about increasing your dose to see if that helps. And D, you should have noticed the difference by now. I'll let your healthcare provider know right away. The correct answer is letter A, because the acetylopram is an SSRI and like many antidepressants, it will also require time to build up therapeutic levels in the bloodstream and often taking about one to four weeks before the client starts to feel better. And the nurse should provide this information to manage expectations and also promote adherence. Now, this is something that should be given with food or milk for any gastrointestinal symptoms. And uh, this is usually given once a day in the morning. Now, there are some cases that it can be given crushed if it's a uh, crushable form, if the patient is unable to swallow the medication whole, and there are also different forms. Let's say it could be a scored tablet wherein there is that line that you can cut uh, with that uh, designated pill cutter. And so this is something that will be applicable if the patient will be taking a partial dose of that particular um, strength. Now, there are some instances that this medication might be given at bedtime if there is going to be over sedation during the daytime. And so that would be an exception. Now, if you selected letter B, we know that six to eight weeks might be required for some medications, but for the Lexapro, it will usually take about one to four weeks to show effectiveness. So letter B is incorrect. And letter C, um, the increasing dose is not appropriate unless this is directed by the medical provider. And we know that the client has not experienced yet the expected time frame for the response. Now, letter D is also incorrect because a response typically takes several weeks. Like I have said, it's one to four weeks. So this is way too early to assume the medication is not working. Let's have number 37. A client scheduled for a CT scan with contrast to check for a brain tumor should be informed about typical reactions to the contrast material. Select all that apply. A, visual disturbances, B, flushing of the face, C, warm sensation, D, lemony taste in the mouth, E, small spots on the arms. The answers here are letters B and C. The flushing of the face is a common response to the contrast material as the body is trying to react to the foreign substance. And uh, a warm sensation is another uh, typical response to the conscious material indicating sensitivity to the substance. Now, if you select the letter A, this is incorrect because visual disturbances are not typical response to the contrast during a CT scan. And letter D, a salty taste is going to be reported by the patient, not lemony taste. Now, letter E, small spots on the arms, and this is what we call as petechiae. These are not going to occur as a result of the CT scan with contrast. Now let's have number 38. A client with bipolar disorder in the manic phase is on lithium therapy. The nurse notices the lithium level is 1.8 milliequivalents per liter. What should the nurse do next? A. Continue the prescribed dose and observe for any side effects. B, stop the medication until the lithium level falls to 0.5 milliequivalents per liter. And C, request an increase in the lithium dose due to the low serum level. And D, hold the medication and contact the healthcare provider immediately as the level may be toxic. The answer is letter D. When you're seeing a level of 1.8, this is above the therapeutic range of 0.5 to 1.5 milliequivalents per liter, which is going to increase the risk for toxicity. And the nurse here should notify the healthcare provider immediately. 
If you select the letter A, continuing this current dose of the lithium would be unsafe because the level is already elevated. It can increase toxicity risk. Now, letter B is also incorrect. Stopping the medication, the drug, or the medication entirely without the healthcare provider's guidance could worsen the client's condition. So this is not going to be an appropriate intervention this time. And if you select a letter C, increasing the dose when the level is already high can also lead to toxicity. So your task here in this question is to recall the normal range of the lithium level, which is around 0 0.5 to 1.5 milliequivalents per liter. Let's have it. number 39. What advice should a nurse give to a parent caring for a two-month-old infant experiencing colic? Select all that apply. A, provide smaller, more frequent feedings. B, burp the infant regularly during feedings. C, apply a warm heating pad to the baby's abdomen. And D, give sweetened warm tea when the baby begins to cry. And E, gently rock the baby in a calm, quiet environment when crying starts. The answers are letters A, B, and C. So if you're selecting letter A, when you're giving smaller, more frequent feedings, this may help reduce intestinal cramping because it decreases the amount of air the infant swallows during the feeding. And for B, the frequent burping during the feedings can also help minimize the amount of air swallowed, which will also reduce the intestinal cramping and discomfort. And letter C, which is the application of warm heating pad to the baby's abdomen, can also help relax the abdominal muscles and will also alleviate the cramping. Now, if you select the letter D, this is incorrect because warm Sweden tea is not a recommended remedy for colic and it may not provide significant relief. And for letter E, while providing a quiet room can be soothing, but it is more effective in preventing crying than addressing the cause of the colic once it occurs. Now let's have number 40. A client with stage two hypertension is prescribed a low sodium diet, limiting sodium intake, to two grams daily. Despite dietary education, the client complains about the taste of the food and asks family members to bring in high sodium items, such as a ham and cheese sandwich with fries. What is the most appropriate nursing action? A, request a consultation with a dietitian to explain sodium restrictions. B, educate the family members on the importance of the low sodium diet C, include the client and family in a discussion about the prescribed diet. And D, remind the client about the consequences of consuming high sodium foods. Your answer should be letter C, because when you're engaging both the patient and the family members in the discussions, this will ensure everyone understands the dietary restrictions and also the reasons for them. And with the involvement of the family, this can improve adherence because they're gonna play a significant role in the client support system. Now, if you select letter A, this is incorrect. We know that the dietitian can provide detailed dietary advice, but the nurse must first ensure that the client and family understand the fundamental importance of sodium restriction. And letter B, um, directly educating the family members without including the client may also violate the client's autonomy and privacy. Now for letter D, is this is also incorrect because if you're simply reminding the client, this may come across as a punitive and does not address the root cause of the dissatisfaction or also the misunderstanding. So here you need to look for that option that involves collaboration and also client-centered care. So you're going to look for those clues like include, discuss, which will foster understanding and also teamwork, which will align with the nurse's role as an educator and also as an advocate. Let's have number 41. A client with a history of seizures and partial occlusion of the left common carotid artery is admitted. 
The client has been taking phenytoin for 10 years. What should the nurse do first in planning care for this client? A, place an airway and restraints at the bedside. B, collect a detailed history of the seizure type and frequency. Letter C, ask the client to remove dentures and eyeglasses. And D, watch for increased restlessness and agitation. You should be selecting letter B this time because a comprehensive seizure history is very important for planning effective care because we know that phenytoin is primarily used for tonic-clonic seizures. And the history should include the types and the frequency of the seizure. Now, if you select the letter A, this is incorrect because restraints and airway placement should not be automatically implemented. And uh, we know that with the use of the restraints, this can possibly cause injury and placing objects in the mouth during seizures is risky. Now, letter C is also incorrect because removing the dentures and eyeglasses is unnecessary unless the client is actively seizing and the client's routine should be respected this time. Now for letter D, this is also incorrect. We know that restlessness could signal the onset of a seizure, but the client's history is more critical for understanding seizure patterns. So for you to get the correct option in this question, you need to prioritize those actions that can gather necessary data for a clear under assessment and also understanding of the client's condition. So here you need to avoid those actions that can lead to patient injury. Let's have number 42. Following in a successful lithotripsy for renal stones, a nephrolithotomy is performed. Which findings should the nurse immediately report to the healthcare provider? A, passage of pink tinged urine. B, presence of pink drainage on the dressing. And C, in a total intake of 7, 1750 or 1,750 mLs of fluids within 24 hours. And D, urine output of 20 to 30 mLs per hour. The answer is letter D. The normal urine output, a nephrolithotomy, should be at least 30 mLs an hour. And so if you are only seeing about 20 to 30 mLs per hour, this suggests a problem. It can indicate that there could be some obstruction or possibly impairment of the kidney function, which requires immediate attention. Now, if you selected letter A, passage of pink tinge urine, this is expected after the, the procedure. And also if, let, if you're seeing letter B, presence of pink drainage in the dressing, this is also expected finding after the surgery or uh, yeah, the procedure. However, if you are gonna see bright red drainage, this might indicate active bleeding and this will be reported to the medical provider or the uh, attending physician. So what you should do here is to focus on what is considered a normal post-procedure outcome, especially regarding urine output. And for those changes that fall below expected thresholds, this may indicate complications and these will require prompt reporting. Let's have number 43. What signs are typically observed in infants and young children with failure to thrive? select all that apply a hyperactivity b language delay c being overweight d susceptibility to illness and e responsiveness to stimuli the answers are letters b and d because children with failure to thrive often will experience developmental delays including language motor skills and also social development delay now, letter D is also correct because failure to thrive children are typically frail and they are at a higher risk for illnesses, both physical and emotional, due to the poor nutrition and development. If you select the letter A, hyperactivity, uh, this is incorrect because infants with FTT or failure to thrive are generally lethargic and they will not show or will they show, or they were only going to show little or no hyperactivity at all. Now, if you select the letter C, being overweight, well, 
that's exactly the opposite. Um, we are going to expect more of an underweight in this uh, children, and they're often going to fall below the fifth percentile for growth. And letter E is also incorrect because infants with failure to thrive will also have limited responsiveness to the stimuli. And this is reflecting delays in the sensory and also cognitive development. So your strategy in selecting the answer is to, or answers, is to eliminate the options that will describe traits inconsistent with the FTT, such as hyperactivity and also being overweight. And you have to look for those answers that are much more related to developmental delays and also being frail, which are key signs of failure to thrive. Number 44, a client discharge after a nerve stimulator implant to manage chronic pain requires education on its use. Which statement indicates correct instructions? A, pain medication will no longer be needed. B, the transmitter is worn externally for activation and C, it is safe to use a tub bath while wearing the device. Indeed, that transmitter may disrupt nearby electronics. The answer is letter B. The transmitter is placed externally and it's used to control electrical stimulation to manage pain effectively. And if you selected letter A, the client may still require analgesics for optimal pain control. And uh, letter C is incorrect because top bats can be taken, but the transmitter must be disconnected before that. Now, letter D is also incorrect because the device generally does not interfere with other electronics. So I want you to review about the use of the nerve stimulator implant. Let's have number 45. After surgery under general anesthesia, a client is at risk for respiratory complications due to retained secretions. What independent nursing action can best prevent this complication? A. Frequently reposition the client. B. Perform nasotracheal suctioning. Letter C. Use postural drainage techniques. And D. Implement chest copying therapy. The answer is letter A, because the repositioning can help mobilize respiratory secretions. It can also prevent the pooling of those secretions, and it can promote lung expansion. And this is also an independent nursing intervention that can reduce greatly the risk of the complications, such as lung collapse or pneumonia. Letter B is incorrect because suctioning is typically a reactive measure to clear accumulated secretions, and it's not a preventive intervention. Letter C is also incorrect because postural drainage is part of respiratory therapy, and this will require a provider's order. And D is also incorrect because chest cupping, which is part of the chest physiotherapy, also requires an order and this will require specialized training as well. So when you're answering this test question, you need to focus on identifying the independent nursing interventions that prevent rather than reacting to the complication. Let's have number 46. A family member brings a relative to the emergency department because they believe the relative has been acting strange. Which of the following statements would justify involuntary hospitalization? Select all of that apply. A, I cry all the time. I am so sad. B, since I retired, I've been feeling really down. C, I want to end it all with slipping peels. And letter D, voices tell me to kill all prostitutes. And E, my boss always picks on me and it makes me so mad. The answers are letter C and D. For letter C, uh, this statement reflects suicidal intent, which requires immediate intervention and also consideration for involuntary hospitalization. And D, the threats to harm others are taken very seriously and would warrant involuntary hospitalization to protect others from harm. While if you selected letters A, B, and E, these are incorrect, because A, 
which actually reflects crying and sadness alone, don't meet the criteria for involuntary hospitalization unless they are accompanied by an intention to harm self or others. And for B, uh, the feelings of depression after retirement do not themselves justify involuntary hospitalization. And letter E, although anger is present in the statement, it is not a direct threat to self or others. So you should focus on the other statements or the statements rather that indicate immediate dangers to self or others because those are the primary reasons for involuntary hospitalization. Let's have number 47. Which clinical signs should a nurse anticipate in a client with meningitis that indicates increased intracranial pressure? Select all of that apply. A, irritability. B, bradycardia. C, heightened alertness. D, decreased pulse pressure. And E, lowered systolic blood pressure. The answers are letters A and B. For A, this is a classic sign of increased intracranial pressure because of the disruptions in the central nervous system. And this behavior is often seen as a result of pressure on the brain. And bradycardia is a late sign of increasing ICP. And as we know that when the pressure increases, the body will respond with a slower heart rate due to the effect of pressure on the brainstem. Now for letter C, this is incorrect because with children having increased ICP will typically have decreased alertness. They also have altered consciousness, not heightened alertness. Now for letter D, the pulse pressure, which is basically the difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, will tend to widen, not decrease. So we have to eliminate this one. Now, letter E, systolic blood pressure that is lowered is incorrect because in increasing ICP, the SBP or the systolic blood pressure usually increases because the body is trying to compensate for the pressure. And also, um, when you are um, in a select the option here, you need to look for those signs associated with increasing ICP, such as changes in the patient's level of consciousness and also their behavior. And also remember that vital signs like the heart rate and the blood pressure may change in ways that can also indicate ICP increase, such as the bradycardia or increasing systolic blood pressure and widening of the uh, uh, pulse pressure. Let's have number 48. After a ventriculoperitoneal shunt is inserted in an infant with hydrocephalus, which nursing intervention is essential in the first 24 hours post-surgery? A, position the infant in a high Fowler's position. B, administer the prescribed sedative. C, position the infant on the same side as the shunt. And D, monitor for signs of increasing intracranial pressure your answer here should be letter d you have to monitor this client for signs of increasing icp because a blocked shunt could cause the cerebrospinal fluid to accumulate and this can lead to a dangerous increase in the icp now if you selected letter a position the infant in a high fowler's position is not ideal immediately after the surgery because it can affect the intracranial pressure. The infant should be placed flat to reduce the risk of complications. All right. Take note that there's already a shunt being placed. So this will help drain the excess fluids. Now, letter B, sedation is actually not advised because this can possibly mask the infant's level of consciousness and it will make it harder for you to detect those changes especially the neurological status um, or manifestations of increasing icp now letter c is also incorrect because positioning the infant on the opposite side from the shunt is recommended to avoid putting pressure on the shunt valve and also the surgical site so to ensure 
proper drainage of the cerebrospinal fluid. Let's have number 49. A nurse is caring for a client with a continuous bladder irrigation. What is the most important nursing action? A. Monitor specific gravity to assess hydration status. B. Subtract the amount of irrigant from the total output to calculate urine volume. C. Record urine output every hour to assess kidney function. And D. Collect a 24-hour urine sample to evaluate urine concentration. Your answer should be letter B this time. You need to subtract the amount of irrigating solution from the total output to determine the actual volume of urine excreted. If you selected letter A, measure or monitoring the specific gravity, um, this is not going to uh, measure accurately the uh, output, especially with a CBI. Letter C is also incorrect because hourly urine output is typically only necessary if there are other concerns about kidney failure or possibly oliguria. And letter D also is an incorrect option because the 24-hour urine collection is inaccurate when continuous irrigation is being performed. The irrigant is actually going to be mixed with the urine, so it doesn't serve any purpose. Number 50. Four days after abdominal surgery, a client has not passed gas and no bowel sounds are detected. Paralytic ill use is suspected. What is likely, what is the likely cause of this condition? A. Restricted blood flow to the intestines, B, nerve impairment affecting bowel function, and C, bowel perforation leading to inflammation, and D, physical blockage within the intestinal lumen. Your answer here should be letter B because the paralytic ileus can occur when the nerve impulses to the intestines are disrupted, and this is caused by the manipulation of the bowel during the surgery and also the anesthesia or possibly infection. And this is going to result into a temporary cessation of the peristaltic movement. If you select the letter A, this is incorrect because a reduction in the blood flow can lead to bowel necrosis, which is a more severe condition. And letter C is also incorrect because this is going to present typically with a more severe pain and also signs of peritonitis, not ileus. Now, letter D is also incorrect because the physical obstruction causes hyperactive bowel sounds initially, not absent bowel sounds. Let's have number 51. When applying a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation unit for a client's pain management, what should the nurse do? A, position the electrodes where the client feels most relief. B, use the settings specified by the healthcare provider. And C, set the unit to operate for 10 to 20 minutes per session. And D, adjust the unit based on the client's pain relief feedback. Your answer should be letter D, because adjusting the intensity uh, based on the client feedback can ensure optimal pain relief. Now, if you select the letter A, this is incorrect because as we know that client feedback is also important, uh, but uh, electrode placement is also guided by the pain location, the type of pain, and also the anatomical landmark. So you should practice proper electrode positioning because this is very important for the therapy to target the nerves and not simply where the client assumes it may be effective. Now, if you selected letter B, using the setting specified by the healthcare provider, this is also incorrect because the pain management with TENS is highly individualized. So you as a nurse here must adjust the settings to meet the client's tolerance and also pain relief needs, which may differ from the prescribed defaults. 
Now, if you select the letter C, set the unit to operate for 10 to 20 minutes per session, this is also incorrect because the duration of the TENS therapy can also depend on the type of pain, the unit specifications, and the client preference. And the 10 to 20 minutes um, duration is a common range and sessions can last longer or possibly shorter based on the client's needs in response to the therapy. So when you are answering this test question, you have to prioritize client-centered care and eliminate those rigid options that do not consider client input. 52. A nurse is advising a parent on preventing accidents while caring for a six-month-old infant. Which motor milestone should the nurse emphasize? A. Sitting up independently. B. Rolling over. C. Crawling short distances. And D. Standing while holding onto furniture. The answer should be letter B because at six months, infants are typically able to roll over and this milestone should be emphasized because the parent may leave the baby unattended and possibly not realizing the baby's ability to roll and this can potentially cause fall from an elevated surface now if you select letter a this is incorrect because sitting independently is generally achieved between ages seven to eight months so it's not really the main concern at six months now, for letter C, crawling short distances, um, this is something that can occur around nine months. So this is not an immediate concern for a six-month-old. And letter D is also incorrect because standing by holding onto the furniture is a milestone that is typically reached between eight to ten months. Number 53, a patient on the psychiatric unit inquires about psychiatric advanced directives which of the following should guide the nurse's responses? response? A, a surrogate decision maker is not required. B, a patient can specify the treatments they wish to receive during future hospitalizations. C, involuntary admission is not necessary when a patient is a danger to themselves or others. And D, a patient can consent to or refuse psychiatric treatments in the event of a future mental health crisis. Your answer should be letter D, because the purpose of the psychiatric advance directive is to allow the individual to make decisions about their mental health care ahead of time. And this will specify those treatments they may accept or possibly refuse in the event of a mental health crisis that can incapacitate them. For letter A, this is incorrect. Although a PAD or the Psychiatric Advance Directive can outline the preferences for the care, a surrogate decision maker is often needed to ensure the patient's wishes are followed during a crisis. B is also incorrect because patients cannot dictate exact treatments in a PAD, but they will provide a guidance, guidance for the healthcare per team to follow when a crisis occurs. Now, letter C, uh, this is also incorrect because involuntary admission can still be necessary if the patient poses a threat to themselves or others, even with a psychiatric advance directive. Let's have number 54. A client undergoing alcohol withdrawal has been prescribed chlordiazepoxide, or known as Librium, 100 milligrams every hour. After receiving 300 milligrams over three hours, the client continues to show signs of acute withdrawal. What should the nurse do next? A. Notify the client that no more chlordiazepoxide can be given. B. Administer more chlordiazepoxide based on the CWA score. C, request a different medication in place of chlordiazepoxide, and D, notify the healthcare provider that the maximum dose of chlordiazepoxide has been reached. The answer is letter B. Because when a client is in acute alcohol withdrawal, the treatment is based on the severity of the symptoms. 
not the medication dosage. And the CWA, which is basically the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment Scale, this is the tool that will be used to assess the withdrawal symptoms and the chlorodiaz epoxide is dosed accordingly to the patient scores. Now, if the client is still experiencing the withdrawal symptoms, the medication dosage may need to be increased based on the CWA score. Now, if you select letter A, this is incorrect because there is no maximum limit for the chlorodiaz epoxide in the acute withdrawal cases. And again, the dosage is adjusted according to the client's symptoms. Letter C is also incorrect because switching the medication is not necessary because the client may still tolerate higher doses of chlorodiaz epoxide depending on the withdrawal symptoms. And D is not necessary uh, because the maximum dose, because the client can handle higher doses of symptoms persist. Now, for questions about alcohol withdrawal uh, symptoms, you have to focus on the management of the manifestations rather than the medication limits. Let's have number 55. A client with schizophrenia has been prescribed Respiridone or Respiridol for type 2 negative symptoms. Which of the following outcomes suggests the medication has reduced these symptoms? Select all that apply. A, the client shows less agitation. B, there are fewer dilutions. C, the client demonstrates more interest in unit activities. And D, the client reports no more hallucinations. And E, the client performs self-care tasks independently. You should be selecting letters C and E because uh, type 2 or negative schizophrenia symptoms often involve a lack of motivation and interest in social and personal activities. And so for letter C, improvement in the engagement in unit activities and also increasing independence in performing activities of daily living are signs that Respiridone is helping these symptoms. Now, if you selected letter A, agitation is a positive symptom, which is type one, and this is not a negative symptom. So a reduction in agitation is not an indicator of improved type two symptom. Now, letter B is also incorrect because delusions are also a positive symptom, type one, basically. And so improvement in the delusions is not related to type two symptoms. And we have letter D, which is also incorrect because hallucinations are positive symptoms. So a resolution of the hallucinations can also indicate that there is improvement in type one symptoms, not type two. Let's have number 56. A client using a patient-controlled analgesia or PCA pump after surgery reports inadequate pain relief despite multiple attempts to self-administer. What action should the nurse take first? A, notify the healthcare provider for further evaluation. B, reassess the client's pain level in an hour. And C, examine the intravenous line and delivery system and D, adjust the PCA pump to deliver doses more frequently. You should be selecting letter C this time by verifying the IV system. This can ensure that the medication is being delivered correctly, and this will also rule out mechanical issues. For letter A, this is incorrect because the healthcare provider can should only be contacted if the system issues, if no system issues are identified. And uh, letter B is also incorrect because if you're waiting for, uh, because the waiting itself can also prolong the client's discomfort unnecessarily. And D is also incorrect because nurses are not supposed to alter the pump settings without the prescriber's order. Okay. Let's have number 57. What should be the nurse's top priority when caring for a child with acute laryngotracheobronchitis? A, start measures to reduce fever. B, administer humidified oxygen. C, 
provide emotional support to reduce anxiety. D, continuously assess a child's respiratory status. Your answer should be letter D, as we know that laryngeal spasms can occur unexpectedly in children with laryngotracheal bronchitis. And this can also help ensure the airway remains patent and also will allow you to detect early if there's any respiratory distress. Now, if you selected letters A, B, and C, these are all incorrect. We know that um, reducing the fever, administering humidified O2, and also providing emotional support are all important. But these are secondary to ensuring the child's airway is clear and their respir respiratory status is stable. Let's have number 58. What is the first action a nurse should take when a child seated on a chair begins having a tonic-clonic seizure with a clenched jaw? A. Try to open the child's jaw. B. Move the child to the floor. C. Call for assistance from the other health or staff members. D. Place a pillow under the child's head. The answer is letter B. Moving the child to the floor is the best immediate action to prevent the risk of falling. And this can prevent uh, the potential injury to the head. And um, letter A is incorrect because attempting to open the child's jaw is unsafe. It can possibly result to injury to both the child and the nurse. And it is important to not to try to force the jaw open during a seizure and letter C, although it's also helpful to call for assistance, but the priority is protecting the child from any injury, not waiting for other staff members. For letter D, this is also incorrect. Placing the pillow under the child's head could possibly cause um, the airway obstruction, especially if the child's head is tilted forward during the seizure. So you should focus on safety and also preventing the child from falling. 59. What is the most appropriate nursing intervention for a three-month-old infant with a myelomeningocele awaiting surgical correction in the pediatric intensive care unit? A. Use disposable diapers. B. Position the infant prone. C. Perform neurological checks above the lesion site. And D. Wash the area below the lesion with a non-toxic antiseptic your answer should be letter c because performing neurological checks above the lesion site is crucial in monitoring for any signs of complications such as spinal cord damage that may also affect the infant's neurological function now letter a is incorrect because disposable diapers should not be used because these can irritate or potentially contaminate the exposed um, sac and the area needs to be kept uh, clean and dry. Letter B is also incorrect because positioning the infant prone is essential for preventing pressure on the exposed sac, but it's not a substitute for performing neurological checks as well. And the infant should be positioned properly to avoid any further complications. Now for D, there is no need to use antiseptic to wash the area below the defect unless there is visible contamination or infection. And the focus should be on keeping the area clean and free from pressure. Number 60. A provider prescribes imipramine tofranil 75 milligrams three times a day for a patient. What nursing action should be taken when administering this medication? A. Advise the patient that barbiturates and steroids won't be prescribed. B. Instruct the patient to avoid cheese, fermented foods, and chicken liver. D. Or letter C. Monitor the patient for increased tolerance and adjust the dose if needed. And D. Ensure the patient is checked for increased intraocular pressure and teach about glaucoma symptoms. You should select a letter D this time because tofranil can increase the intraocular pressure. So 
the patients should be monitored for glaucoma symptoms. Now, for letter A, this is something that is applicable to monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but not in mepramine. And for letter B, this is also incorrect because dietary restrictions related to cheese and liver are relevant to the MAOIs, not tricyclic antidepressants like amipramine or tofranil. Now, letter C is also incorrect because tolerance is not typically a concern with amipramine, unlike other some uh, other um, antidepressants. Let's have number 61. A client develops hydrocephalus two weeks after undergoing cranial surgery for a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. The nurse identifies that the hydrocephalus is most likely due to which physiological response? A. Vasospasm of nearby cerebral arteries. B. Ischemia in the Broca speech area. And C. Increased production of cerebrospinal fluid. And D. Blocked absorption of CSF from the arachnoid space. Your answer should be letter D, because after a ruptured aneurysm, the blood can block the arachnoid villi, and this can disrupt the absorption of the CSF, which will lead to the hydrocephalus. Letter A is incorrect because vasospasm is a typical response during the acute bleeding phase, but it's not the cause of hydrocephalus. Letter B is also incorrect because ischemia in the Broca area can cause speech deficits, but it's not related to hydrocephalus development. Now for letter C, this is also incorrect because there is no increase in CSF production following a ruptured aneurysm. Um, increased, the, uh, increased production may occur with possible tumors, but not in this type of scenario. Let's have number 62. A client reports feeling bloated and experiencing abdominal swelling after surgery. Which nursing interventions are most suitable? Select all that apply. A, check for bowel sounds. B, offer carbonated beverages in small amounts. C, promote walking as tolerated. D, provide a straw for liquid intake. E, administer prescribed pain medications such as opioids. Your answer should be letter C and A because the ambulation can stimulate intestinal movement. This can help release trapped gas and also ease abdominal swelling. And with A, assessing the bowel sounds can also help evaluate the return of the GI function after the surgery. B is incorrect because fizzy drinks like soda can also increase gas in the intestines. This can worsen the distension. And letter D, drinking through a straw can also lead to swallowing air. This can exacerbate the bloating. And letter E, opioids can also delay bowel function by slowing the peristalsis, which can also aggravate the distension. 63. A nurse is explaining to the parents of an infant diagnosed with patent ductus arteriosus. Which of the following is the best explanation of this condition? A, the aorta is abnormally enlarged. B, there is an opening in the wall between the left and right ventricles. C, the entrance to the pulmonary artery is narrowed. And D, it is a direct connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. The answer is letter D. The ductus arteriosus is a fetal blood vessel that connects the pulmonary artery and the aorta to allow oxygenated blood to bypass the lungs. But after the delivery, this specific blood vessel typically closes. But if it remains open, it is what we call as the PDA or patent ductus arteriosus. Now, in PDA, the direct connection between the pulmonary artery and aorta continues, which can lead to abnormal, uh, abnormal blood flow. Now, if you select the letter A, this is incorrect because this is unrelated to PDA and uh, enlargement of the aorta could suggest another cardiac issue. It's not PDA. For B, this is also incorrect because this describes a ventricular septal defect where there is a... Uh, 
there's that uh, where the wall is actually separating the ventricle is uh, also defective. And letter C is also incorrect. Uh, this refers to the pulmonic stenosis, which is basically the narrowing at the entrance to the pulmonary artery, but it's not associated with the PDA as well. So in this question, you need to look for the key terms uh, in the questions, such as a connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta, and also to eliminate those choices that describe structures or issues unrelated to the condition in this question. Number 64. After a three-year-old child undergoes cardiac catheterization, which nursing intervention takes priority? A, encouraging early movement and ambulation. B, checking the catheter insertion site for bleeding. C, limiting fluid intake until blood pressure stabilizes and D, comparing the blood pressure in both lower extremities? The answer should be letter B. Because after the cardiac catheterization, the bleeding at the insertion site is the priority because hemorrhage after this procedure is a life-threatening complication, especially that an artery is involved. Now, if you select the letter A, Early movement is contraindicated because the child should remain immobile for about several hours after the procedure to, re to prevent the risk of bleeding. And also fluids should be given as tolerated, not restricted, unless there are any complications. And letter D is also incorrect because pulses, not the blood pressures, are assessed for symmetry in the lower extremities. And this is to ensure adequate circulation. 65. What healthy snack should be recommended for a two-year-old with asthma? Select all that apply. A, grapes. B, ice cream. C, apple slices. D, oatmeal cookies. E, cut up vegetables. F, cold milk. Your answers should be letter C and E. Because apple slices and cut up vegetables are nutritious and safe snacks for toddlers with asthma. And these can be easily handled and does not really exacerbate asthma symptoms. Whereas uh, letter A, grapes can be a choking hazard for the toddler, especially with their shape and also the skin. And letter B, uh, the cold drink or any um, anything like ice cream can also trigger bronchospasms in children with asthma. Now, letter D, oatmeal cookies are also high in sugar and fat are not beneficial as fruits, uh, as, not as beneficial as compared to the fruits and the vegetables. 66. A healthcare provider orders restraints of PRN for a patient with a history of violent behavior. What is the nurse's responsibility in the situation? A. Request clarification regarding the type of restraint. B. Acknowledge that peer and restraint orders are not acceptable. C. Implement restraints as soon as the patient exhibits aggressive behavior. And D. Ensure the entire care team is informed of the restraint order. Your answer should be letter B because peer and orders for restraints are not permitted because this requires specific documented justification, also regular re-evaluation. And so if restraints are necessary, a new order must be obtained each time. Now, if you select letter A, we know that clarification is important uh, to ensure restraints are appropriate, but the issue is the use of a PRN order, not the type of restraint. For letter C, the restraints should be a last resort. And um, before we're going to apply that, we should be employing less restrictive interventions first. And for letter D, this is also incorrect because it's not enough to just inform the team. So restraints need a specific order, not a general directive. 67. A person experiencing prolonged cold exposure arrives at the ED. Which symptoms of hypothermia should the nurse expect? Select all that apply. A, rapid breathing. B, numbness in extremities. 
C, confusion or stupor. D, red fleshed skin. E, restlessness or anxiety. Your answer should be letter A and C because initial hypothermia rather may uh, manifest with increasing respiratory rate to increase, maintain, or to maintain oxygen delivery. And for letter C, hypothermia also slows down brain metabolism, and this can lead to altered mental status, such as confusion or stupor. Now, if you select letter B, this is also incorrect, uh, because hypothermia can cause pallor due to the reduced blood flow and will often accompanied by cold-induced numbness. For D, this is also incorrect because uh, peripheral vasoconstriction usually causes pale skin, not redness. Now, E is also incorrect because anxiety is not common in severe hypothermia as the client becomes drowsy and they will be less responsive. So in this uh, test question, you need to look for the clinical signs of slowed metabolism and also blood circulation and eliminate those choices indicating warmth or red skin or hyperactivity or let's say anxiety. Number 68, a three month old infant is diagnosed with congenital hypothyroidism. What should the nurse tell the parents about the long-term effects if treatment is not started right away. A, mexedema, B, thyrotoxicosis, C, spastic paralysis, and D, intellectual disability. Your answer should be letter D because congenital hypothyroidism results from a thyroid deficiency due to an embryonic defect. And this can impact the infant's brain development before birth, and this can lead to cognitive impairments. Now, what's needed here is early treatment, preferably before three months of age to prevent further neurological damage. Now, if you select letter A, this is a severe form of hypothyroidism that occurs later in life, and it's not a concern for newborns. Letter B is also incorrect because this refers to hyperthyroidism, which is not associated with congenital hypothyroidism. And this can occur due to a thyroid hormone overdose, but not untreated hypothyroidism. Letter C is also incorrect because this is related to cerebral palsy. It's not related to hypothyroidism. So in this question, you have to look for the answer related to cognitive development um, because as untreated hypothyroidism can affect the brain function. It can also lead to intellectual impairment and avoid those uh, confusing terms like mixedema, which is not applicable to infants. 69. A patient is receiving lithium. What is key nursing intervention for this medication? A. Limit the patient's sodium intake. B. Test the patient's urine specific gravity weekly. C. Monitor the patient's serum lithium levels regularly and D, discontinue other medications for several days. Your answer should be letter C because lithium has a narrow therapeutic window and this requires regular monitoring of the lithium serum levels to prevent toxicity. Now, if you select letter A, this is incorrect because limiting sodium can cause electrolyte imbalance and this will increase the risk of lithium toxicity. So your patient here should maintain a normal range of serum sodium. Letter B is also incorrect because regular uh, urine-specific gravity testing is unnecessary for lithium therapy, and discontinuing other medications is not typically required unless this is specified by the healthcare provider. Number 70. A nurse is providing counseling to a client with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS. What should the nurse include in the discussion? Select all that apply. A, break up tasks throughout the day. B, participate in group social gatherings. And C, ask for pain medication if leg discomfort worsens. And D, plan for alternative communication methods. And E, apply leg restraints to prevent physical harm. Your answers should be letters A and D. 
you have to space the activities to help preserve the client's energy and to prevent fatigue, which is crucial in managing the ALS symptoms. And for D, this is also correct because it, as soon as the ALS progresses, communication can become difficult due to the muscle weakness and alternative methods like writing or using electronic devices are also very important for maintaining communication. Now, letter B is also, in, uh, this is incorrect, participate in group social gatherings. Uh, this is something that should be avoided because this can increase the risk of infection, which is particularly dangerous for ALS patients due to respiratory complications. And letter C, opioids should not be used in ALS because this can depress their respirations and leg pain is not really a common issue in ALS. And letter E is also incorrect because the leg restraints are not recommended. What we should be expecting here are braces or splints to manage mobility and also to prevent injury. Number 71. Following radiation therapy to the neck area post-surgery for throat cancer, which complications should the nurse prioritize monitoring? A, skin irritation, B, bone marrow suppression, C, dryness in the mouth, and D, swelling of the mucous membranes. Your answer should be letter D, because radiation commonly causes the inflammation of the mucous membranes, which can lead to airway obstruction, and this is going to be the most critical reaction. A is incorrect because this is expected, but typically not life-threatening. And B uh, is also incorrect. This is an uncommon uh, happening, uh, especially with neck-focused radiation. Now, letter C is also incorrect because the dry mouth, which we call a xerostomia, can interfere with eating and hydration, but it's not a medical emergency. Let's have number 72. A client has a sustained spinal cord injury at the C7, C8 level, leading to spinal shock. What clinical signs should the nurse expect to find immediately after the injury? Select all that apply. A, muscle spasms. B, inability to control bladder or bowel function. C, flaccid paralysis. D, difficulty breathing. And E, absence of reflexes below the injury. Your answers should be letters C and E because the spinal shock can result into flaccid paralysis of all the muscles below the level of the injury, which can last from 48 hours to several weeks. And the reflex below the level of the injury are temporarily absent during the spinal shock. Letter A is incorrect. Uh, because the spasms can typically occur after the spinal shock subsides, not during it. Letter B is also incorrect because during the spinal shock, there is usually a retention of urine and stool due to the decreased tone. And so incontinence is uncommon. And letter D is also incorrect because respiratory function should not be severely affected unless the injury is above C4. But below C4, respiratory function is generally preserved. Let's have number 73. A one-month-old infant is being evaluated for congenital aganglionic megacolon. What tests should be used to confirm the diagnosis? A, colonoscopy, B, rectal biopsy, C, multiple saline enemas, and D, fiber optic nisoenteric tube. Your answer should be letter B, uh, the rectal biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosing Hirschsprung's disease because it can allow the examination of the rectal tissue for the absence of ganglion cells. Now, letter A is incorrect because this is not used to confirm Hirschsprung's disease. And the multiple enemas and C's may help relieve the symptoms, but these will not confirm the diagnosis. And the fiber optic mesoenteric tube is not used to diagnose the Hirschsprung's disease as well. Let's have number 74. After surgery for hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, what should a nurse teach the parents to do after feeding to reduce the risk of vomiting? A, rock the infant. B, keep the, the infant in an upright position. 
C, lay the infant flat on the right side, and D, stimulate the infant to stay awake. Your answer should be letter B, because positioning the infant upright after their feeding can help use the gravity to reduce the likelihood of vomiting. If you're selecting letter A, this can aggravate vomiting, so this should be avoided. And letter C is also incorrect because laying the infant flat can also increase the chance of reflux and also aspiration. And letter D, uh, this is also incorrect because activity could trigger the vomiting. So it's better to keep the infant calm. Number 75. A client with arthritis mentions having received various dietary advice over the years. Which daily dietary plan should the nurse emphasize as most appropriate? A, consuming adequate portions from diverse food groups. B, incorporating yogurt and blackstrap molasses regularly. And C, taking a large dose, taking large doses of multivitamin supplements. And D, adding wheat germ and yeast to meals. Your answers should be letter A. This is a well-balanced diet that includes foods from all food groups, and this aligns the MyPlate dietary guidelines as well. And while we know that arthritis itself does not really require a specialized diet, we have to really maintain optimal nutrition through diverse food choices that can support overall health, including joint and bone health. If you selected letter B, this is incorrect. Um, because we know that these foods may be nutritious, but they are insufficient to meet all dietary needs. And these in exclude those many essential nutrients required for balanced nutrition. Letter C is also incorrect uh, because excessive vitamin supplementation can also pose health risks, including toxicity. And this is going to be unnecessary if the client consumes a balanced diet. And letter D is also incorrect. Although these foods are nutrient rich, but focusing solely on specific items will not provide a comprehensive nutritional approach that's supposed to be needed in maintaining good health into this patient. So this is the end of our Q&A. So I am again inviting you to prepare to pass your NCLEX with confidence by enrolling to our Stan Coast NCLEX coaching, where you will be able to access over 10,000 real questions, daily live sessions, and also 500 hours of recorded content, and also 100 hours of animated crash courses, 50 practice exams with NGN style questions as well. So act now, do not wait. We still have that 70% off. Um, in the offer and uh, we want to make sure that you're doing this today to make sure that you will be able to access our library and so please visit uh, www.stankosnflexcoaching.com to enroll and thank you and you have a great day and is something that can maintain oncotic pressure and also fluid balance but it's not involved in immunity Number 34, a parent asks why the closure of their cl child's cleft palate should be done before age two. What 